Hello and welcome to another episode of Matthew talks about games that he likes to you. That's it. That's that's what we do. <laughs> that's, that's the premise. The first game I have for you this episode is Land vs. Sea. This is a tile placement game of making areas of land and areas of sea. Stands to reason. And the beginning of this game you kind of feel like this is Carcassonne, right? You're doing very Carcassonne things. You're placing down these hexes onto the board. Hexes is different. And you want to create areas of land if you're the land player or sea if you're the sea player. The biggest twist comes almost immediately because if I, as the land player, finish off an area of sea on the board, they get the points. Sea gets the points for the area of sea being finished. I don't want that to happen, but I needed to do because you've only got two tiles and you've got to well you have technically four tiles because when you take tiles you can see the tops of them but they're double sided so you can use either side and that also means that you never know quite what your opponent is going to do you have a, a rough idea they can place a tile onto the table but you never know exactly what they're going to do because the back side of the tiles is hidden to your opponent so that's what you're doing you Create points for yourself by either finishing areas that you want. As a land player, I want to finish areas of land and hopefully make it so that any place that the C player goes also benefits me. That's what you want to try and do because you have to connect like to like in a Carcassonne type of way, land to land, sea to sea. But the other thing is there's other ways to score points. In the base game alone, there are these X's, these because it's like Treasure Islands kind of looking game. And this is a very beautiful looking game. I really like the way it looks. There's these X's, and I might, as the land player, finish someone's C area. They get the points. They get one point per tile. but So they get four points, say. But there's eight crosses on them, or six or seven crosses on them. I get the points for those. But also, I want to finish land areas that also have crosses on them. So you never want to put too many crosses onto an area because you don't want to make an area too tempting for your opponent to say, I'm just going to finish it. And that dynamic of pushing your luck in this game changes it up so much and makes it a really exciting tile placement game. The cool thing as well that also gives it an undeniable Carcassonne-esque vibe is that there's modules baked into the game that you can play with to add complexity, which I advise playing with all of them, but you can play with as many of them as you want, which makes the game accessible. There's these wayfinding points, which when you kind of like put them down, get you extra points later on when they're finished off. That's one thing to think about. There's, I've got these out. There's the mountain and coral. Uh, scoring because the tiles not only have land and sea they've got mountains on the land and coral on the sea and you're trying to score points by placing down connected areas of coral or connected areas of uh, mountains that's an, another way for you to get points and then there's the caravans and ships this is really cool because it scores you extra points for placing these caravans and ships onto the board if you're next to another caravan and or ship doesn't matter which but then at the end of the game you're also going to score points if i'm the land player and there's a a caravan that's been created essentially a line of different of these ships or camels if you've got the majority in that line so if i'm the land player there's more camels in the line than boats i get points for that i get a point for each one so that's another complexity none of them are complex but all of them add something really cool to the game i love tile laying i love carcassonne and this is such a valid and exciting twist on that type of thing and it's really got that give and take that oh please don't go there because it's gonna get me so many points and you don't want to finish off what your opponent's doing and you want to try and think of all the different ways to score loved land versus say hey below this video is my referral link to kienda they are responsible in part for making this episode possible and i really appreciate them for that if you click that link that customizable link now it says tgib you can find your way to Kienda where you can get some money off and it helps me out. So for all your UK board gaming needs, that's where I'd go.
Thank you. The next game I have for you is Batoku. Without going into too much depth, Batoku is a massive sprawling game of doing lots and lots of intricately connected systems that chain off each other, that do things, that do another thing, that do another thing, that get you the points. It's a heavy experience of a game that took a while, frankly, for it to kind of unfurl in my mind. But once it did, that was a really good feeling. When you first look at the board, you go, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> it's ridiculous. But then you realize that all oh, these sections are where you put dice, these sections is just where you get these tiles, this section is just where you walk in your pilgrims. And once you learn the different bits of it, it does unfurl. It's definitely a game of lots and lots of little different parts, which then all make a greater whole. In the game, what you're trying to do is get points, I guess, and you're doing that by not only are you deck building, because you are playing cards out each turn into your different onto your player board, and those cards are going to benefit you in ways and give you actions. They're also going to unlock dice in whichever order you want to unlock those dice, which are going to give you more actions depending on which dice you unlock. And then you can move those dice up and do another actions or do even stronger actions by weakening the dice. You want to build buildings, you want to get your pilgrim to move across the board and gain some enlightenment to get bonuses. You want to collect lost souls and you want to collect fireflies and you want to connect those two things together because when you connect them and you finish them and your lost soul goes off to happy place it's happy because it gives you loads of stuff it gives you loads of points you're deck building with all your yokai cards and you want to deck build so you've got the really good cards and you want to have the best actions but then you also want to retire a card so that you can score points at the end of the game you're trying to also get area majority on these kadama tracks so you want to get push yourself up these tracks because there's lots and lots of big points to get you want to walk up a, uh, your own spiritual path because that's going to be a great way to get points and get points by set collecting to get a bunch of points you want to move your pilgrim you want to unlock these pilgrims you want to get these crystals <laughs> which give you powers every turn or end game scoring they unlock your pilgrims and then you can use those pilgrims to do a bunch of things like move up tracks and go on walks and get enlightenment <sighs> yeah Oh, there's some whispering stones that, that talk to you and get your points. I'm not even being facetious. That's, that's genuinely, that's something in here. The one thing as well that I love about Potoku that is so incredibly important is that it gives you these cards. These cards that, you're that are goals, essentially. And there's different ways to get these cards. But they give you, hey, you need this, this, and this. And they remind me a bit of like Yido or something like that, honestly. But it's like, you need to do this, this, and this. You get to pick two of these cards, pick one. And without them, gosh, you could just go, I could do anything because there's so many different paths to go down. But if you have these cards, you go, I'm going to pick these two. This one scores me this amount of points. This one scores me this amount of points. I'm going to try and do this, this, build a building, get two people up a tower, which is a whole thing to get enlightenment and, you know, that type of thing. And once you have these cards, it really helps you play the game because it says, this is what you're trying to do. Get really good at doing these few things. Try and find cards, end game scoring cards that are going to chain together that already worked towards the thing that you're doing. That's super important. When this unfurls to you, not only is it beautiful to look at, it's pretty beautiful to play. It's very impressive. Heavy for, um, for the, my taste of games, this is at the max heaviness of games that I enjoy. I am a light, I like lighter games, I really do. But Botoku manages to ease us into that heaviness, lures us in with the beauty of the game because this is undeniably one of the most beautiful games I've ever seen. It's gorgeous. Okay, <laughs> let's calm things down just a minute <laughs> with Dodo from Cosmos Games. Now this is a German version of the game, but it's a language independent kids game, essentially a cooperative kids game, a cooperative kids memory game called Dodo. And let me tell you, this game's so fun. <laughs> 
It's hard as well. What you're doing in Dodo is there's this egg. The Dodo's egg has fallen. It's rolling down the mountain really slowly because it's this magical egg that I don't understand what's inside of it. Is it like magnets? Is it full of goo? Who knows? But it rolls very slowly. It kind of goes tick, 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 and it's rolling. And you need to build the platforms for it to roll down and drop down and roll. Oh, it's so satisfying to see. You need to build those platforms so that eventually at the end you can get it to go into this little boat and you can save the dodo's egg. That's what you're trying to do. And you do this by rolling a dice. Each of the different platforms gets more difficult to build and the final boat gets even, the, that is the hardest thing to build. And it's got essentially uh, an amount of empty slots on it that need filling with resources and what you do is you roll the dice and then you pick a token and you need to match the token that you pick with the dice face that you roll. If you roll bamboo then you need to find a bamboo. If you don't then it's the next person's turn. They need to have a go. And so that's where the cooperative memory goes. You say this was a bamboo and you put it back down. The next person rolls a dice and they they need a, a plank of wood and they go which one do I go? And it's like this one, this one was the plank of wood. So they turn it over and go oh yeah that's it, I got it. And you're trying to just do that the whole time. And it's a cooperative memory game which makes it so much better, I think. I really do. I mean, let's be honest, this is a kids game, but I cannot wait to play this at a convention. Like play it with a bunch of adults and have just a massive amount of fun being loud and annoying in the convention, playing Dodo, and everyone comes up to you and looks at the table and goes, what the hell is that? It looks so impressive, it's gorgeous. You can make the game harder, you don't need to. It's, I'll be honest with you. The dodo egg rolls slow. We don't roll slow enough. It, it's, this is a this is tough. But you can make the game harder as well if you want to. And there's an also a, a variant to make it easier and harder with these uh, people that live on the island that can be active as wilds, which are very helpful as well. Loved it. Dodo, silly, silly fun. I think this is going to be an absolute hit of a kid's game. And certainly one of those games where I'm like, I just want to play this anyway because it's fun and silly. Two o'clock in the morning when everyone's overtired, you know people are going to be laughing playing Dodo. The next game we talked about Carcassonne is Fire and Stone. It's, this is by the designer of Carcassonne and in it you are going to be flipping some tiles and doing the best that you can to try and be the best tribe moving out into the world. I've been excited about this game for a while. So what you're doing is you start off on this, there's this world map and there's a bunch of tiles face down on it. And on your turn, you can move and flip a tile. And you don't know what you're gonna get. And you think, well, where's the game? But the game kind of gets more and more interesting and involving as the game goes on, right? Because your options start to open up. The first lot of it is, Flipping tiles and seeing what you get. When you flip a tile, you get the activation of the tile that you flip, when you, the discovery action, but then you also get the action of the space. And those can be animal tiles. You're trying to collect animal tiles because you need the resources that they provide. You put them on your board. So now you need to go and find a campfire tile so that you can turn the animal resources into usable resources via the campfire. You're trying to put huts down because the majority of scoring in this game really is going to be through majorities. You're trying to get majorities of huts on board. You have a hut on a, on a space, then you get a point. If you have the most huts on that space, then you get another point. You need food to build huts, so one big thing is getting the animals so that you can get the food, and you want to get bags, which is another resource, so that you can hold more food. If you collect these forageable things that you get set collection of these forageables you get to get inventions which give you extra things like uh, you can now use shipping routes you can get some more gathering space you can get some more bags to hold food and all those type of things are ways of set collecting to try and get make the things you're trying to do easier get food to build huts the first area unlocks after three huts have been found and when you find a hut you get to immediately place the thing, that's really good. And then the next area opens up where there's better and more interesting tiles as you go on and then you unlock another person that you can do so you start getting two actions per turn with both of your workers and then the third area opens up. And then the game kind of becomes this game of moving to the different spots, I'm going to get some food so I can get the bags, I need the food to build more people, more huts. Now I'm sure that that explanation of this game was about as good as most explanations I heard of this game. 
a game that really didn't make any sense to me until it got played and then you go oh this is so easy so simple but so fun and quick and satisfying and exciting i really liked fire and stone i thought it was just stellar like as a gateway game that kind of like welcoming game that i like to play and it just is fun and you can make some really interesting decisions do you give up your special ability this in this invention that you've got do you give that up now to go get more points because that's an option that you have you cover up the ability well, you want more points. Four points at the start of the game? That's a lot of points to be getting. I think this is going to go under the radar for a lot of people, but I urge people to try Fire and Stone. I really like it. This is right up my street, though. The final game I have is Now or Never. This is the only one I'm in this trilogy that I have played. I've not played uh, Above and Below. I've not played Near and Far. I have played... Islebound, which I really enjoyed, and I have played the Ancient World 2nd Edition, let's be honest with ourselves, which I also really enjoyed. But this is the trilogy of story-driven, adventure -y type games that things happen and that has meanings and you can go and do the, there's a plot in here, there's a campaign, there's chapters to play through. This is definitely my first impressions of this game because I've not played through all of that. In fact, I've played through very little of it. I've played solo and I've played without the story part of it which is a big aspect of the game so take this for what it is it's going to be a very long time until i get a chance to play through the campaign which is something i do want to do in the game what you are essentially trying to do really more than anything is build up your little town <laughs> you're trying to build a little town and you've got these buildings to build and there's Lots of different aspects of how to do that, but essentially you are building these buildings into this town in layers and you want to get different buildings to give you different benefits to get you because you get the villagers that can go into the houses, into the buildings, and they're going to give you resources every turn, which you're definitely going to want to use because you need the resources to do other stuff. And they're going to give you a perpetual income, but they're also going to give you points. Getting the buildings and getting the villagers is going to be a great way to get points that's what you're trying to do but of course that's the economic side of what's going on on your board what's going on in the game is you're traveling around the map doing things going on adventures and fighting things and going to towns you've got the option to either kind of like activate on your specialists which gives you abilities gives you actions and items to do or you can do a hero action and move around the board go to a location one cool way to get points is to is questing you can deliver things to quests and go to different places that you need to go play a quest card get a lot of points that way or you can vanquish monsters and vanquishing monsters is cool because you know vanquishing monsters now the way that those two things interact is interesting right because on the, on the board you've got this Economic game of building your little town, which is fun and satisfying and you want to do that well. <laughs> and then on the board, you're going around doing an adventure. A lot of people have said the game is very long. And it is. It's a long game. And the other thing that people have said was that how the... I wanted to know what people's general vibe of the story aspect of the game was without spoiling it. And I've heard that it's good and I'm excited to do that because the way the story works is there's spaces on the board and they're paired up with paragraphs in the chapter that you're playing and it gives you a, do you do this or do you do this? Which is something I've never been interested in before in games, but then I played The Adventures of Robin Hood, which does exactly that. And I loved it. So now I'm like, oh, maybe I do enjoy that in games. Combat is fun in this game, I feel like, because what you do is you're essentially rolling a dice, a four-sided dice, and it gives you an action that you have on your asymmetrical all the players are asymmetrical you all got different actions and abilities and stuff like that and you get to attack or defend in certain ways depending on what you roll but you can level up those things through experience or buying gear and that's cool and you can get stronger and you feel like you're getting stronger i really enjoy that some of the actions on the board are going to be a way to transfer resources get more villagers you definitely want villagers because of that perpetual income all the time a big twist in this is that you aren't at the very end of the game you get rid of everything <laughs> before you do your final scoring and you have to see how good your production is one last time essentially you can trade resources in for money which is points but it kind of shows you that you have to 
You can't bank and bank and bank on things. If you get resources, you need to spend those resources. Get the engine of the game running with those resources because you can't save it. You want to build as much as possible because it's that last production phase that really matters, which is also something that you definitely need to make everyone very aware of before you start because someone's going to be very disappointed when they realise that all their seashells are worthless. I feel like what it's really tempting to do is be Dungeons & Dragons, <laughs> you know, to be a role-playing game. You know, I really feel like I get that feeling from this because you're going to places doing the either or kind of questions. Do I do this? Do I do this? But you're also leveling up your actions and your combat ability and you're rolling dice and you can spend, you can roll dice and you get uh, uh, your ability, but you can also spend health points and stuff or mana and stuff to do extra actions and to boost things. It feels like a sprawling D&D-esque type board game. I think if that's what you are prepared for going in then then i think you can enjoy it even more but that's my first impressions of now or never and i'll probably come back to it when i played it even more through the story which i definitely want to do also it's absolutely gorgeous of course setup takes a while because there's so this is a heavy box but yeah i liked it and that's all the games didn't we go through the gamut with this one i know we like to have some type of running theme throughout these videos but this is lacking in this one I suppose if you like any of these games or like the look of any of them then I urge you to go and find more content on these games find other people who have spoken about them talked about them played them reviewed them previewed them people done run throughs see what other people are saying never just take my word for any game because I might just really connect with land and sea for instance because of something that happened to me when I was a child I don't know <laughs> you know well I've enjoyed all these I don't think you can go wrong with any of them as long as you know what you're getting into especially with Patoka and now never but that's it that's for another episode of games that I've enjoyed until next time 